Welcome back to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Today's guest is Calgary City Council candidate for Ward 8, Monique Offrey. Monique, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Monique, uh, let's dive right into it. Where does your sense of duty to serve come from? Well, I have been a social worker for 20 years. I've led nonprofit and social profit organizations for my entire career. So serving people and communities is what I do. It's what I've been doing and it's what I want to keep doing, but I'm interested at taking it up a notch and serving my community at a different level. And people forget how much impact that one can have uh, municipally with regard to um, moving things forward. So that's where I am and that's what I want to do. Was duty to serve instilled at you, instilled upon you as a young uh, girl, or was this something that you picked up uh, over your career, over your time in here in Calgary, and where you're originally from, from the Maritimes? Yeah, you know, it's I love reflecting on this because I've done so many different things in my life. I've been really blessed to have opportunities that have afforded me all sorts of. Um, interesting adventures. I, I was a wine consultant for a while. I was a flight attendant for a period of time. Um, but I've always loved learning and studying. And I really found myself in university, first um, doing a BA at St. Mary's University in Halifax, and then going to Dalhousie to do a Bachelor of Social Work, and then later a Master's. While I was studying, I was always taking up different opportunities. So I'd be working part time in the summer while I wasn't working, but or studying and those jobs just would lend themselves to another, another opportunity that would grow and grow. And so I found myself one summer studying in Europe, French language and literature, and I met some really interesting people. And that sort of opened my mind to understanding the world in a different way. And in those days, I was working part time as a wine consultant. So I also had the opportunity to visit some vineyards and earn some extra money and just live the high life in my 20s. Um, but it was really the people who I met who inspired me to keep exploring different ways of thinking and doing things. And so when I came back from studying in Belgium and visiting wineries in France, I had an opportunity to, to work in a refugee camp in the Netherlands through the university. And I think working in the refugee camp in the Netherlands in 2001 is what really uh, transformed my desire to come back to Canada and to give back to my own community um, in a different way because what I learned from working with the asylum seekers and refugees is that people who had no choice but to leave where they came from because of war or um, various other reasons of having to find refuge in a different country, really wanted to find themselves surrounded by people who understood them and loved them. And for a lot of people, that was always a desire to actually return home. So for me, I thought, what am I doing abroad when I could be um, surrounding myself with my family and my community and applying what I've learned. And so I came back to Canada, um, finished my master's. And when I finished my master's, I actually had another opportunity to go abroad. And this time it was working on landmines and anti, the anti landmine movement and raising money for that. And this was right before 9 11 happened, actually, a few months before 9 11. And that forced, I think, the whole world to think about um, how we interact with each other and our, our world in a different way. And my desire to go overseas to do that work just kind of was refocused into a focus in Canada and my own community. And um, I ended up having a daughter as a single mom, and I wanted her to understand the world and where she came from. Uh, to have access to family and friends and things like that. And so for me, giving back has meant different things. At times it's meant giving back in a way where I'm actually the one receiving more. I'm learning, <laughs> right, from yep. the people I'm interacting with. And I'm, you know, unabashedly um, 
bringing that information, that knowledge back to my environment to apply what, what I've learned. So I don't know what value I've had in those environments at that time, but I certainly have gained a lot from, from those experiences and it has informed my lens. Um, so, so I, I got to ask the question. I got to ask the follow-up yeah. question here because yeah. you you have, and I've I've looked at your LinkedIn page and I've looked at your res, your uh, website. You have an extensive background, a massive background that anyone would be envious of. <laughs> Why choose politics in 2021? Why give back to your community? at the municipal level? And why did you decide that 2021 was going to be the year that Monique threw her hat in the ring for ward aid? <laughs> Truth be told, um, I'm at a stage in my life at the age of 50 where um, I am an empty nester. Um, I'm also a widow. I lost my husband two years ago in 2018 and that's changed. Um, what my reference points are and and my commitments to my family um, and so you know running for politics requires an enormous amount of commitment to the process of running and then to serving your constituents and although i've served you know as a leader in my community as an ngo in the ngo world or nonprofit world or social profit world running for politics is a huge investment not only of time but of resources in a different way and I was never really able to do it until now. You know, I have more time on my hands. I have more um, expertise and wisdom and I think credibility to bring to the table after all of the years that I've invested in community at this level. Um, so, you know, whether it be uh, accumulating business acumen and having a background and having to balance budgets and work with boards of directors and serve constituents as a professional um, you know, I, I'm able to now bring that to the table in a different way. And I also don't have the people at home <laughs> relying on me the way they did five or 10 years ago. So why 2021? Well, well that, it's, you know, it's, it's as simple as that. Um, I'm at a time in my life and career where the demands are different. Um, I'm able to serve people outside of my circle in a different way at a different level. And uh, there's been a lot of urging for women to get into politics and um, the time for me has come. And it's so it's 2021 and not 2015. <laughs> no, understandable. Um, one of the key things a candidate for any political office has to do is talk to the residents, talk to the constituents, talk to yeah. the, the your neighbors. Um, you may have an idea of what the issues are for your ward, but until you actually start talking to your neighbors, talking to the uh, people who be voting for you, you don't really get a true sense. When you've started to talk to the people of Ward 8, have you heard things that you were A, aware of that were concerns for the people of Ward 8? And were there issues that you weren't aware of that you wanted to learn a little bit more of? And what were they? You know, I, that's a really great question. And I think, obviously, I've been reading what's in the media. I've been reading what's on um, various um, political channels, issues of the day and issues that are controversial or not so controversial, et cetera. So, you, you know, as a candidate, you come into it with that knowledge. But it's not until you knock on doors and you actually hear residents of the ward um, interpret that information or those issues from their own lens that you realize how the issues impact people on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'll give you an example. I was door knocking yesterday and um, I live in Ward 8 obviously and well maybe it's not obvious but I do um, and I'm running in Ward 8. I live in Killarney. I was knocking on a door and uh, there was a dog on the doorstep and the woman had to come out and calm her dog down a little bit, but clearly animals meant a lot to her because she kept stressing how much she cares about animals. And when we asked her, you know, what municipal issues matter to her most, she paused for a minute and she wasn't sure where she was gonna go with her question, but it had to do with parks. And we talked about Richmond Green and we talked about how she felt about about Richmond Green and she said that for her 
her ability to access green space with her animals was so near and dear to her heart, but also provided a huge amount of mental health benefit to her. Um, and so when she walks her dogs, for example, at any one of our beautiful parks, whether it's Ed, Edworthy or wherever she happens to go, she pauses to appreciate the nature around her, the, the greenery, the rocks, the pathway. And what struck me is that for her, she didn't necessarily say this is really good for my mental health. But for me, as someone who's campaigning on quality of life factors that have to do with good mental health, what I've been saying is that, you know, our green spaces mean a lot to us for, for different reasons, whether we're engaging at Richmond Green by playing tennis, um, or young people are playing baseball, or you see seniors doing yoga, getting outdoors and breathing the fresh air and engaging in physical activity is something that we all know we benefit from, from a mental health perspective. So on the heels of COVID, I think a lot of us are thinking about what the future holds for us and how we interact with one another and our environment. And space has really become one of those things that people are reckoning with. How do I interact in my space? I spent a year and a half wearing a mask. I couldn't go outside. I couldn't go to restaurants. Um, and now we're coming out of that. And some of us have suffered job loss, job insecurity. There have been increased rates of um, addiction and and poor mental health as a result. So I really appreciate when someone is willing to open their door and have a conversation with me and with this particular neighbor it was a really enlightening conversation for me and she invited me to go with her on a walk. She said, you know, you should really come with me. I'll show you this path um, and I'll take her up on that. Um, and so even though she didn't think that her issue had to do with a municipal um, uh, topic matter, it really does. And it really connects to, I think, um, something that many residents of Ward 8 have been calling on us to think about, and that is the use of green spaces and parks and uh, what, how we can balance urbanization, densification, with a desire to retain our connection to green spaces. And uh, it came up at a, at a different door in a different way where the neighbor said, you know, I really don't mind so much densification, but you know, I'm not going to have as much lawn space and lawn space is important because, and she started to list the reasons why that lawn space was so important to her. So I think the issues are, are uh, complex. I think there are threads that unite us, um, but they're also uh, sometimes they require us to look a little bit deeper and think a little bit more critically about what this is really about. You, you mentioned a few things there that I do want to talk about and dive a little bit more deep into, because the one, the first thing I want to talk about is that mental health aspect, because on your website, votemonique.ca, which for my listeners and my viewers, the link to it will be in the show notes. I highly recommend that if you're in Ward 8, check it out. But you, you have the three pillars of the uh, competence, curse, uh, courage, and compassion. And in the courage, and this is the one I want to talk about, is that mental health advocacy. Uh, your background is quite impressive when it comes to mental health. Um, but you say on your website, I believe mental health is a human right. My experience and resilience have empowered me to work in support of the most vulnerable. How will you address mental health at a city level? Because uh, you might talk to some people, and I'm not trying to be flippant when I ask this question, but people yeah. might think mental health isn't a city issue. It's not something yeah. that people, and you, you mentioned it right there, it's not yeah. an issue that people want addressed. They want lower taxes and that's all. How will you, as your role as the next counselor yeah. for Ward 8, address the mental health stigma at in the city of Calgary? Whew, that's a loaded question. I don't know. <laughs> I, lo I love I loaded know questions. Yeah, I don't know how I can answer reducing the stigma other than, you know, if I'm applying my courage value or my compassion value or the courage value about actually having the conversation in the first place, which is what that courage uh, pillar is about, like, let's actually talk about this. 
Let's actually talk about the fact that we have increasing rates of violent crime in our city. Let's actually talk about the fact that um, we have increasingly high rates of domestic violence in our city. Let's talk about the fact that the opioid crisis is impacting all of us, uh, whether personally or by extension. And that these are things that we're going to have to continue dealing with, regardless of what our position is on higher taxation, lower taxation, etc. Because at the end of the day, the city's portfolio around serving people and safety is the number one um, power of the city and job of the city to ensure, right? The city has to ensure that its people are safe and looked after. How we do that, we can debate around uh, the, the city's budget. Um, but, you know, I, I know what the city's budget is. I know what the city's expenses are. And at the end of the day, some of these things that we're dealing with, if left unattended, end up costing taxpayer dollars more at the end of the day. So we've talked about, um, well, on the mental health front anyway, um, I was very pleased to see that the city supported uh, the Connect the Dots initiative, the mental health and addiction strategy that uh, Karen Gosby and others worked so hard on. You know, it's $25 million and $25 million is not going to solve all of the issues, but that those dollars go to supporting very important community-based organizations that are already doing a lot of heavy lifting that understand the issues to reduce the burden on our society in terms of having to deal with the negative outcomes of some of these um, social problems that we're dealing with. So, you know, if we can at least come to the table prepared to talk about it and try to problem solve. And, you know, I'm really big on crime prevention. So I'd pr w much rather look upstream than downstream. I'd much rather look at the ways that we can prevent and mitigate some of this, um, what we're talking about here today from happening in the first place so that we don't have to end up spending uh, dollars down the road on something that could have been prevented or that we could have pulled some resources together to mitigate against. So I hope that that touches on uh, it, what you're it, looking for. It does, and it, it brings up another point. Um, we have mentioned uh, mental health around COVID-19. COVID-19 has left people home houseless. Uh, yep. The businesses in our communities are closing up shop because the open, then close, open, then close, then throwing money at yes. trying to re retrofit their business. Yeah. As the next councillor for Ward 8, you were responsible not just for the people of Ward 8, but for all Calgarians. And I, I want to, and that's why I'm happy to do this with the ward candidates because sometimes they forget that while you were a ward candidate you were there to represent all of calgary calgary sorry um yes how do you envision yourself advocating for everyone in a post-pandemic world where we have seen our finances at our city hall decimated because a the oil collapse and then b because of the pandemic how do we ensure that we get back on a proper foot but don't leave everyone behind. Yeah, absolutely. So I moved to Calgary. So I, I say I'm a Calgarian by choice, right? I've chosen this gorgeous, beautiful, resilient, vibrant city. Um, I know that the city has weathered many a storm. I know that the city has had booms and busts, et cetera. And I know that the city and Calgarians have suffered greatly as a result of economic downturns, the oil and gas uh, crash, the COVID-19 and small businesses being um, really bearing a lot of the brunt with regard to opening and closing, not to mention healthcare workers and all, everyone who has paid a price for, for the last you know, year and a half. Calgary has an opportunity to change the narrative in terms of who we are and what we're about and where we're going. And there's so much potential in this great city and people talk about new industry coming to the city to the downtown whether it's you know through the arts um you know the film industry or agri tech or i've even you know read some literature that points to the fact that alberta and calgary in particular are world leaders in new technologies related to agricultural technology and artificial intelligence so all i'm trying to say here is that all calgarians benefit from a thriving economic 
environment and a thriving downtown core and a city that offers its, its people um, opportunities to feel like they can contribute and have a good quality of life here and be safe and enjoy the Rockies and enjoy their green spaces. So what I say as your Ward 8 counselor is that um, I will certainly look to, I said this before, the benefits of the whole versus the benefits of the individual. And that doesn't mean I would neglect the desires and wants and needs of Ward 8. Uh, but if we have a thriving city, then all residents benefit from that. And certainly Ward 8 is in an interesting, it's a very interesting ward because it's in the city center, essentially. It's like, if you look at all the wards, Ward 8 is the heart of the city in large part. And it's the heartbeat of the city. So there is no, no taking Ward 8 out of the discussion around a, a wonderful, thriving, resilient uh, Calgary. So I think we have some opportunities from a business model perspective to look at um, innovating how we look at our revenue streams. And I'm not talking about increasing taxes here. I'm talking about um, examples of ways, and this, this is coming from my CEO experience. The first thing you do as a CEO is you look at your business model, you look at your funding streams. Of course, you're looking at your expenditures and you're having to make sure you have a zero balance budget always. Um, but if there are opportunities for Calgary to innovate and uh, bring, a, 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 <laughs> what am I trying to say here? Newer perspective to how it does its, its funding model, that's really exciting to me. And I'll give you a small example that I've given to others. And I, again, it's a small example, uh, but it comes out of Montreal and it has to do with the Airbnb taxes that were rolled into the hotel tax stream. So, you know, that's it, it, it's just one example of something that can be done that doesn't impact Calgarians' um, bottom line with regard to this idea that we have to continuously increase prop, uh, residential property taxes or small business tax. I think that's outdated. Now, uh, as a business uh, a business person, you know inflation happens. Cost of doing yeah. business in the city always goes up. You may try to make it a magic wand and it will be frozen at zero, but inflation does happen. Yeah. Um, that affects the bottom line of any budget. If inflation goes up, taxes will have to co correlate by going up as well, or services will have to be cut. Because like you said, you have to look at the services yeah. you're providing and yeah. if you're going to yes. cut them. How do you envision working with the next council and ensuring that the services that we are providing the people of Ward 8 and the city are a value of the tax dollars that are being spent or being collected from the residents and business owners? That's everybody wants to know that how we're going to do that. Um, <laughs> well, you're you're running for council. I don't need to know the answer. Know. No, 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 no. I mean, everybody wants to know that we have a solution to this, or that we have a, a view to uh, making sure that uh, we can keep up with inflation and keep our businesses open, and and that we're not increasing taxes. Um, you know, we know as Calgarians that well, we've there have been some job losses and, and we've been hearing more about youth leaving the city and the province. Uh, that's a tax base that we cannot afford to lose. Um, so we really have to do our utmost to make sure that, um, Cal, you know, Calgarians are staying in Calgary and that we're attracting newcomers to the city. No question about it. On the issue of efficiencies, there's always work to be done there. And it doesn't, you know, I mean, until you actually get in there and you start to open the books, you really, it, it's difficult to really be able to weigh in on that precisely. But I can tell you um, that the city, and I'm gonna use the social services angle because it's the one I know best. Um, the city funds and supports many social services. And um, from time to time, we, we look and we consider whether or not some of those services are being run as efficiently as possible. Um, but at the end of the day, the bigger question beyond the obvious efficiencies related to it are the impact that some of the services uh, are having and whether or not it's a has a positive impact. So, you know, I think there's always opportunity to continue examining um, whether or not the services we're providing, and I can take it out of the social services, but, you know, are they optimal in terms of the output that, you know, are we getting a good return on our investment? 
and um do the people of ward 8 believe they're getting a good return on their investments right now i can tell you the people of ward 8 don't want to see their property taxes increase um i think that it depends on on who you ask in terms of you know how they feel about various social services that might be offered or their ideas about whether or not it's a good investment of the city to be going down a particular path um, but i'll use crime as an example again you know people the people i've been talking to are are increasingly concerned about um, what they're seeing and hearing and you know, I'm just going to kind of try to tie it into uh, an article that unfortunately we all probably saw in the Herald recently that looked at the rates of suicide within um, the restaurant sector and, and, and people trying to make their living, um, you know, working in restaurants and, and, and coping with the impact of COVID-19 and, and so on. And, and so, you know, you can't have a thriving small business if you don't have a healthy populace to work in your small business, right? So, so it goes together. Um, it's, it's not one or the other. And I'm certainly not here to say that every social program is the end all be all at all. What I'm trying to say here is that we have to bring a balanced approach to what we're investing in and what matters to us as Calgarians. I think the common denominator is a good quality of life. I think everybody can agree. It doesn't matter what neighborhood you live in in the city, you want to have a good quality of life and you want to feel safe in the community that you're living in. One of the things that many people do before moving to a city, uh, especially from urban areas like I did, I moved up from Slave Lake, originally from Ontario, come, come, come to yeah. Slave Lake, then moved to Calgary. I, I, I looked at the news. I looked at the news of what was happening in this, uh, this city. And this is on the safety aspect. What before I bought a house, I looked at the crime rate because I want to know if I'm moving to a safe community. After moving here, it was it seemed like a safe community. I see report after report, news article after news article of gangs, unsafe streets, stabbings, shootings. How do we change that narrative? How do we change that narrative to make it a more friendly community that or a city that we are trying to promote because we are not the only city that is going uh, dealing with a, ten, a retraction uh, uh, of residents and a, attention of uh, residents. How do we change the narrative of we are not a safe city to being a safe city? Oh, great question. And uh, you know, if I am elected as a city councilor of Ward Eight, which I hope I am. That will be probably my biggest commitment to the city is really looking at how we can ensure that as we're as we're working together at creating this thriving, vibrant, economically resilient, healthy city is that we understand better some of the social issues that we're dealing with, not from a fear based perspective, but from a place of better um, sort of knowledge. So, you know, it's not, I'm not framing it as it's good or it's bad, but um, I'll give you an example of shifts in safe injection sites as an example, or people who are harmfully involved in drugs. If services of support are localized in a particular community and those services are then shut down, consumers of those particular programs are going to go into other neighborhoods to seek out what it is that they require, whether it's a safe place to sleep in an alley or whatever the case may be, um, at maybe, you know, uh, because of a lack of affordable housing or a lack of services of support, every community will be impacted and every community is increasingly impacted. So there's no such thing as is believing that one neighborhood over another is going to um, not be confronted with things like domestic violence, for example. We've already seen the heat map. It's domestic violence as an example is in every quadrant in every neighborhood, every socioeconomic demographic. So how do we make life safer uh, for families? And that would be, you know, women, 
children, men, etc. Um, it's by tackling the issue head on. It's by saying, okay, this is an issue here and we need to deal with it, pretending like it doesn't exist or relegating it off to the side is not dealing with the problem. So, you know, Calgary is a wonderful city and many of us um, enjoy our city and, and we are um, aware of some of the things that are going on and, and they impact us at different levels depending on who and where we are. Um, and, and, you know, I, 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 I really think that, um, I think that when you treat people with dignity and you offer basic standard of living in a way that reduces stigma and breaks systemic oppression, whether it's systemic racism um, and other areas of violence, that your community becomes safer. When people are healthy uh, and are given opportunities to contribute to their communities, more often than not, you see a reduction of systems usage like uh, formal systems, emergency room visits, uh, justice system, policing services, etc. One of the big things that you will be uh, uh, dealing with in your first term as counselor for Ward 8, if you are so lucky on October 18th, is two of the biggest infrastructure projects that Calgary is going to be undertaking probably in the next 10, 15 years. One being the Green Line, two being the arena deal. Now I know that the green line doesn't run through parts of Ward 8, but I'm gonna, I have asked this to everyone. Have you heard from the residents of Ward 8 on this issue? And what are their thoughts? And what are you planning to do as the next councillor to ensure that while we are moving ahead, we have just recently had the federal, provincial and municipal government say it's all go shoveling ground, that it doesn't become a financial boondoggle. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. I mean, the money that's been set aside uh, for the purposes of, of the green line and, and uh, you know, advancing that project are important. Um, I think that really when you enhance the uh, public transit systems and you make them more accessible for people, uh, that it benefits everyone, again, particularly in Ward 8, where there are neighborhoods that are highly congested by traffic, uh, that when you're able to reduce that 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 uh, traffic footprint, um, it, everybody benefits, right? So even if a, a train doesn't, you know, move through your particular ward, uh, the residents of that ward are enjoying the benefits of that public transit. Um, and others are doing the same. So, you know, not every, you know, there are, there are people who are committed to their vehicles uh, while recognizing that uh, perhaps not having three cars in a residential neighborhood is a great thing for the environment or for your neighbors um, and are, you know, cycling and are walking and are accessing public transit. That's wonderful for everyone. And I think, I think that we've reached a point where we can accept that. Um, many people depend on public transit to to get to and from work. The other big infrastructure project, and it seems to be a contentious issue at council, is the arena. The new arena is a very uh, hot and cold issue that people either are very much in favor and very much against. What are you hearing from the people of Ward 8? Is this registering on their radar of something that they are excited about, that they have opinions about? Because this is going to be a project that you're going to be looking at because it is close to your ward. Absolutely. I think it's, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's an issue that some people are for and some people are not for. And I, what I hear is that um, the spinoff, the economic positive spinoff benefits from the arena deal are... Um, are appreciated and are benefit to to our community and, and to increasing jobs and increasing um, uh, um, uh, people visiting our city, tourism. Um, what people don't like is a lack of transparency. Uh, what people don't like is to feel like Calgarians are not getting a good deal. Um, and so I think, you know, this idea of a fair deal uh, for, for Calgary is something that comes up often. And um, Calgarians want to trust that um, 
that the investment, the taxpayer's investment in the arena deal is not one that is being overshadowed by um, a private interest that usurps uh, the public good. And, and I think, you know, when you're considering the pros and cons, uh, there, you know, there, there are both sides of the equation, they're both valid. Um, I'm just cautious of time here. Before we move into my last set of questions, there's one area that I want to touch on that you touched on a bit beforehand, but I want to dive a little bit more deep into it. Green spaces. Um, yeah. Just going back to that, uh, the story of the woman that with the dogs and took you for a walk. Um, while green spaces are great and people would love to have more green spaces, the way our city is set up and the way that the, the densification has happened within our city, it's hard to create new green spaces. How do you envision yourself as the next councillor working to expand our green spaces, but also expand that accessibility to green spaces of for all residents? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm not sure I'm smart enough to answer the question how am I going to increase the green space, but I would certainly be advocating to protect our parks and to protect the green spaces that currently exist um, in the city. Um, you know, we hear often about in terms of in infrastructure downtown and um, uh, buildings that have reached the end of their life cycle and perhaps investing in some of the, the um, infrastructure that currently exists and increasing residential um, access to the downtown people talk about um, rooftop gardens and greening the downtown and I mean the, that's something that just is easily top of mind um, in terms of using the spaces that we currently have to the maximum benefit um, so that's that's, a, that's Lee, the is there there have been some conversations and uh, I, it's not in Ward 8, but it is in a ward close to you that some parks are being sold off to put development in. Um, you you say you're going to protect them. Um, you are one vote. You are one vote on a <laughs> vote of 15. Um, and this, yeah. goes to, this goes to my next set of questions as well. How do you envision working with the next council? Because I... I hear all the time from residents across the city that there is a dysfunction that is happening with this council. People are not getting along. How do you envision yourself working with 15 other or 14 other people plus yourself 15 to ensure the work gets done and things happen correctly? Thank you. Um, first of all, I would say that um, and this is not to correct you, but you said I would vote for I would work toward so so what I, what I promise uh, residents of Ward 8 uh, in their trust in me as, as their city councillor is not to believe that my vote is the end all be all. Every councillor, including the mayor, has one vote. Um, and it is very much about collaboration. And it, it's about ensuring that we can respectfully have a conversation about the policies that are before us and the votes that we are expected to vote on. Um, and so, you know, when if, if we're going to use the green space as an example, um, working to protect the existing green space um, is something that I have heard uh, the majority of the people with whom I've spoken in my ward are hoping their counselor will do. Um, so why would a counselor not work toward that? Well, there could be you know, reasons around the development front that could be appealing to City Hall in terms of the revenue that could be generated from or the densification, the benefits of that type of densification, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm feeling and hearing and sensing is that what's happened is that we can't clearly and respectfully talk about the issues that, you know, I was reading um, earlier today about a counselor who compared, you know, the building of castles and on city council only to, you know, to tear down other people's castles in order to, to demonstrate yours as being bigger and better. We're not going to win with that kind of mentality. No one will win with that kind of mentality. So um, persuading, collaborating, sharing, 
advocating, educating. That's all what this is about, like bringing your ward's interests to the council table in discussion with your, your fellow councillors uh, is, is what's needed. And I think, unfortunately, in the last uh, couple of years in particular, there's been a sense that people's personal agendas are what are what's coming, um, what is being front and center of the the the, um, the public's um, well, their discourse and and what we're we're feeling that as residents of the city of Calgary and in our respective wards that our interests are being put aside in favor of personal agenda. So. Um, no, and I, I appreciate you answering that question because, it, it, and this is more about you as the counselor section of the podcast and the show. Yeah. Um, one of the top, one of the words that you said about the arena deal hit hit really hard with me because I, I have heard from residents yet again from around the city about transparency. Transparency is a must in especially in municipal politics. How do you envision yourself being transparent with the residents of Ward 8 while also protecting that confidentiality that you have to have for city council? You know, I was reflecting on this from a CEO perspective um, in terms of relationships with board members. You know, if you think of council as a board of directors and, and you've got your board members sitting around a table, uh, there is, uh, you know, it is important to have some time set aside for in camera to speak about some confidential issues, but in camera is not to have in camera is not for the sake of having in camera. It's really um, the, the purpose of an in camera session to debate or discuss matters that are um, in the interest of others to be kept um, you know, sort of focused in a particular way for a period of time is for the interests of, of the people you're serving. It's not to keep them in the dark. So um, when I think about the conversations that people are having with me about their ideas of city council not being transparent, I think taxpayers and citizens are owed the respect of knowing in advance um, and after discussions what what is at stake what we're you know we, we don't necessarily need to know the details we don't necessarily need to get into the weeds um but being kept in the dark or feeling that we're not that we're being misinformed um and then this dialogue of misinformation and, and then suddenly everyone's confused right like so being transparent to the taxpayers is of utmost importance um, insofar as you can still get the business done, of course, um, for efficiency's sake, et cetera. But Calgarians are owed uh, in advance to know what council needs to discuss and debate. And uh, at the end of the day, what the outcomes are. I'm glad you, talk, you said that. Um, uh, for my last set of questions, I need you to put, put your magic hat on right now in your time timekeeper hat. And October 19th, you are the official councillor designate for Ward 8 in the city of Calgary. What is priority number one? Priority number one would probably be to thank uh, the other uh, candidates uh, for a respectful run. Uh, what I'm seeing in Ward 8 is a, in, an incredible amount of respect, actually, amongst the candidates. Um, so to make sure that uh, people are made to feel valued for their contribution, this is an incredible contribution that everybody is making to their city and to their friends and, and neighbors. Um, and once, so once, once that piece is recognized and we're moving forward together, um, October 19th is a time for the new council and new mayor to come together and and um, have a, 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 an opportunity to sit together and get to know each other. Um, you know, there's a lot of work to be done. And some people talk about being ready to hit the ground running. Um, but we can't forget that we are going to have many new faces around the council table. And we are going to have a new mayor um, representing the city. And if we want to put our best foot forward, October 19th, the world will be watching Calgary, right? Because 
you know, Calgary is important to, to more than just Calgary and more than just Alberta. Uh, and people, people are watching. And so I think how we proceed together as a team, at least, you know, with respect on day one will be really important. Now, what are the metrics for a counselor offerees first term that in four years time, you would be able to look back and say, you know what, four years on this council, I've got X, Y, and Z done. And I'm happy that I've been able to make a, the city's life better, uh, the city's financials, uh, finances better, but also make it a better place to live for everyone. Well, I would give you a better, or I would give you a more honest answer if you were asking me that in year two, <laughs> right? Like, yep. give me a year, give me a year to hear really directly from from the ward, um, because otherwise, I'm just talking to you about my own platitude, my own my own ideology, my own values, right? Like, I want to make Calgary safer. I want to make people healthier. I want to protect green space. I want people to have accessible, affordable housing. Um, so, so I, the I, metric, I, yeah. I feel, I feel attacked. You're the first one to ever say that to me after asking that question, <laughs> but thank you. In year uh, two, I will call yeah. you up and ask that yes. question. Yes, and in year two, you'll get a really honest answer and one that will reflect the needs and wants of my constituents not what Monique Offrey is saying she's going to do, right? Like for the purposes of getting elected, if you really want to measure how well I'm doing, talk to me in year two. Awesome. Um, but before you can even get to year two, you have to get past yeah. October 18th. Yeah. Uh, this is going to be coming out in September. Uh, you yeah. have a month and a half, a month and a bit before the election date. How can people a learn about you, but get involved in your campaign? Listen, I need all the help I can get. I am still uh, very grateful for any volunteers that are willing to come on board. Um, I am looking for donations like everybody else. Um, I really appreciate what, you, you know, your complimentary introduction. There's a lot to me that uh, you're not gonna get on the lit drop card. So people have to visit my website. Um, and and uh, I think, you know, understanding what's needed at city council for October 19 and moving forward is going to require experience and a level of competence uh, and ability to uh, bring, you know, that level of confidence and competence to negotiate with multiple stakeholders and competing demands on October 19th. So I hope that people who visit my site and listen to this podcast today will think, wow, she's got a lot to offer. I think I'd like to help her out. And I, I forgot to ask my last question before saying that state or that the last question I had, but why should you be the next counselor for Ward 8? Because I'll bring a balanced approach uh, to complex issues. I'm not, uh, you know, a one, one ticket wonder, I, <laughs> one trick pony. I think uh, having led nonprofit organizations, uh, both in Calgary and uh, on the East, um, you know, under my leadership, the one of the last organizations I was the CEO of became one of Canada's uh, top 100 charities, right? And that designation came as a result of financial transparency and accountability. So uh, if, if I can keep the doors open in a nonprofit organization working with some of Calgarians most vulnerable um, and bring that balanced approach, I, I, I can assure you that I'll do the same for Calgary. Thank you so much um, for my listeners and my viewers. Monique's uh, website address, Facebook page, and Twitter will be in the show notes. I highly recommend that you go out if you're in Ward 8 or even if you're not in Ward 8 and you want to learn a little bit more and get involved because this is the uh, an important election. Like Monique said, there is a large turnover this election, so we need to make sure that we have the right people in the positions. Monique Offrey, thank you so much for doing this, for uh, doing this. It was greatly appreciated. And I feel like just scratched the surface of who you are. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. I really appreciate uh, being present for your listeners. And I look forward to hearing from some folks who hopefully will reach out.